when I got this journal and I read this journal mm. and I learned so much about my parents, you know, their, their character, their yes. bravery, their courage, uh, their, their determination, uh, yeah. their, their perseverance. And, and through all these challenges and hardships, their optimism, their, their absolute optimism and resilience. And I never knew these things until I was, till I had read this journal and I was, I was in my, 70s at this point. And I thought, you know, I never want my children to be as ignorant of what came before them, because that's what makes us all what we are, uh, as I had been. Is your son still with the Bucks? Is he yes, still? Yes, very much so. Yeah, so you you still get free tickets to basketball games? You go much? <laughs> I'm his guest. <laughs> You're his guest. I'm his well, guest. Well, listen, let me let me introduce you properly here. Um, you and I are talking on my podcast and live YouTube and Facebook event um, called "In Conversation with Frank Schaefer." This then goes to podcasts, and um, I'm talking today with Barbara Summer. Fagan, whose book here I have an advanced copy of, My American Dream, A Journey from Fascism to Freedom. This is the cover on the hardcover, but um, I've got an advanced copy. And I just want to show you something. I don't know, Barbara, if you can see how many pages yes, I've Yes, yes. Oh, I'm, I'm very taken by that. I, I'm and very notes, happy about that. And page after page of scribbled notes everywhere. Fantastic. Not just in preparation for this pro project of mine in interviewing you, but um, I have things that, from your book that I want to quote, you know, when I write or when I talk, because oh, I have so been so pleased taken to hear with that. Your work. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, this is this is my American dream. I, I hoped so much when I wrote this book, that I would inspire at least one person. And uh, if I've accomplished that, I'm going to be very happy. So that pleases me very much to see all of your dog-eared pages and your scribbled notes. Yeah, I mean, we're going to really get into this book and I'm going to talk about it, but I just want to tell you how it struck me. Um, my youngest granddaughter is nine and she's been ill this morning. So I went up to her house across the street and sat there from 7 a.m. until 1030 uh, reading your book. And I have to tell you, this sounds maudlin and as if I'm putting it on, but um, there's some tear stains on these pages. Mm -hmm. When I was reading your father's diary, um, as a father and grandfather, I related so deeply to what he must have gone through while he was escaping from Germany with you at age two. And by the way, this is you on the cover. And I know this sounds odd, but how fortunate you made a good newspaper photograph at age two <laughs> in 1940, was right. it? Right. Right. Um, and what was this? The Seattle paper. Seattle you were, Times. The Seattle, Seattle Times. Times. And they took this picture of you. And here you are on the cover with a couple of suitcases looking like this was staged for a book cover. But this is real. <laughs> this is real. This is and very I, real. I, I, and, you know, and there's so much about your book in terms of the serendipity and, and the stunning series of events. And you finish up at the end. One of the last things you have in your afterward or your note to your grandchildren is that you know, it's a mixture of luck and being in the right place at the right time. And boy, isn't that your life? Mm. Yes. Really impressive. So yeah. let me let me uh, tell the story of your book a little bit and introduce my readers to you. Um, the first thing I want to say is I just think you're an amazing person. Uh, I love not just the optimism in the book, but the the honesty. And I and I followed the book on so many levels the story of your parents' escape from Nazi Germany, your life in America, being dogged by the anti-Semitism we have in our own country all the way back into the 1950s of not being able to join uh, a sorority and not being asked and being left out. If I had been titling this book, I love the title, by the way, I'm not saying I would have done it differently, I would have opted for one other consideration, and that is the only woman in the room. Oh, yes. <laughs> because that's your story. Yes, I mean, yes. you're a first. We're in the age of, of equity and inclusion. And long before that, 
purely on your merits, nobody in the HR department working for you because, quote, we need a woman in the in the boardroom or we need a woman somewhere. Here you are alone in the in, in, in the era of the 50s and the 60s, you know, breaking every ceiling. And at the same time, you have three sons. Um, you've got this crazy pregnancy with triplets. You nearly die. You've got this other story of just being a woman and all the struggles of being a woman and married and a mother, and you're a good one. And then you become this titan of the advertising industry in terms of market research. And then you wind up on the board of a major company. And now you're helping to run a university and you've endowed a chair there. And I don't even know where to start, except to tell people that quite honestly, I have a, this program is called um, In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. And I have a commentary I regularly do called It Has to Be Said. And we've started a book club called It Has to Be Read. And I told Ernie, my producer, I said, let's pick a month because my American dream has to be in our book club. I just think it's oh, a wonderful book. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. That's uh, that's the introduction of someone who's floored and honored to be talking to you. So I sound all over the place, but I read the book. We're going to go through it. And I just love the book. I love you. I love your family. Uh, I loved your husband. I love your parents. Um, <laughs> there's so much in this book. I just feel so deeply part of just because I'm a human being that's been a father and 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 married for 53 years to Jeannie, uh, just like you had this long passage. Um so we connect on a lot of levels. So I don't know. I don't know what to ask you first. But anyway, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you so much, Frank. I, I really am looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too. So let me just jump in here and talk about the book. The first part of this book, um, and it's in italics at the beginning after an introduction, um, looks like this. And these are the actual words of your father in notes he kept. So first of all, tell me the story of how you discovered not knowing anything about your background because they had not wanted to talk about their Holocaust near miss and escape. And here you are in the United States, I think in, in your 20s, before you know, he kept notes and made a diary out of this. Is that correct? Oh, no, in my 70s. In your 70s, in my that's right. 70s. Yeah. I, I, um, we, we escaped uh, from Nazi Germany, as you said, when I was two years old. Yeah. And it was it was very difficult for my father to figure out how we were going to do this because he mm. waited so mm. long. He had been in the military in for Germany in World War One. Yeah. And his feeling was that he had given to Germany, so Germany would always take care of him. Mm. And he waited and waited. And you know, it was it he he suddenly realized we had to get out because of the persecution of Jews. He he it was Jewish, my mother was Lutheran, uh, and, and he was already not able to work because Jews were not able to hold jobs. Mm. So he looked after me. My mother had a job as an executive assistant uh, to a newspaper publisher, and he finally realized that we had to get out. And um, I know now from having read his journal how frantically he ran around, almost being bounced around like a pinball, yeah. trying to get the appropriate documentation, trying to get um, the, the funds necessary to pay for our passage. We finally got on this train uh, because it was no longer possible to go across the Atlantic Ocean mm. on a ship, which is what he had wanted to do originally. Uh, there, there were German submarines, so no more ships were going across the ocean. Mm -hmm. So we went on this 17-day train trip, and I knew always that we had escaped from Germany or that we'd come from Germany. Yeah. But as you said, I, I knew nothing of the details, nothing. Mm -hmm. My parents never spoke about it. They were totally focused on making a life in America, and mm -hmm. they were so thrilled to be in the land of the free. Uh, having come from a place where they were not free uh, mm. to do what they wanted, to say what they wanted, to be who they wanted to be. Uh, so not very long ago, maybe eight years ago or so, mm. I, I was sitting in my office in New York and my phone rang and it was my sister calling right. me from Annapolis where she lived. And, and, you know, we spoke regularly about our families and so forth. And my sister, Carolyn said to me, Barbara, this is different. I have something really amazing to tell you. Mm. 
I have discovered this journal that our father kept during the run up to your escape. She was born in America later. Yeah. Uh, during the run up to your escape and during the escape itself. And I'm going to send you this journal. Mm. Well, Frank, she sent it to me. And I, ha- I mean, it's, it's not in a book. It's loose leaf pages. Sure. All written in my father's own handwriting. Mm. And a shock really ran through me when I held it. And when I began to read it, mm. I could not believe what my parents had gone through. The, yeah. the, the horror, the terror, the, the real fear for their lives. They talked about this 17-day journey on this horrible, horrible, dirty, awful train that went from Berlin through Lithuania to Russia, uh, including Siberia, Mm. a piece of China, Korea, and finally to Japan, where we then took a Japanese ship, the Hikawa Maru, uh, to Seattle. Very sort of unusual in in that time. Of the boat. Yes, exactly. Well, I, I just, I didn't know how awful this trip had been. Mm. My my parents, uh, they they had the clothes on their backs, mm. what they could carry, you know, a couple of suitcases, yeah. uh, and me. And they brought a tent, not knowing what would become of us when we mm. got to America. And maybe we would have to live in this tent. My father had $10.50 for our yeah. family. And the train trip was terrifying. Yeah. I, as I mentioned, it, it was 17 days, and the train stopped 14 times, as he as he talks about in his journal. Yeah. And each time, my parents had to show their documentation. Sometimes people went through their couple of bags, mm-hmm. and they were terrified that they would be taken off the train, and God knows what would happen to them. Yeah, and your mother's so, throwing some silver she's taken with her out the window because if the Gestapo checked this out, you're done for because she wasn't allowed to take anything with her. Absolutely, absolutely. And that was her big idea. You know, she she thought she'd hide this silver. Yeah. And when we got to, to America, she could sell it and they would have a little more money. Well, and they even brought a tent with them thinking, well, maybe there'll be no place to live in America. Maybe we would have to live in the tent. Exactly. Yeah. So... The, the train was so dirty and there were there were days when they did not have food, when they didn't have anything to drink. It was it was horrifying. And to imagine going on a 17 day train trip with mm. a two year old is kind of beyond my comprehension to begin yeah. with. You know, having had several two year olds over the years, I, I couldn't even imagine. So well, then, they hadn't been telling you about this. So you're 70 years old, your sister or whatever age you were. I got it wrong the first time, but um, but. <laughs> Your sister calls you and she was born in the States and was younger. And your family always rejoiced in the fact that she could grow up and be president. Correct. Correct. They were very proud of that. Yeah, which was because she'd been born here. But I was interested, um, just this is a footnote, but when you did your naturalization citizenship with your parents and they were so proud and then your dad, who at that time still had no money, took you all to a restaurant and it was a very big deal because you never had money to go out. Um, then it, then you were mentioning in the book that your sister also was part of that naturalization process. But of course, she was a citizen or did the law change? Because now these days she was an observer. Period. She was an observer. Yeah. 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 She she uh, she was she was a citizen. And, you know, as as, as you said, my parents were very proud of that. And mm-hmm. they they often said we have one person in our family who can actually who can be president, president of and, the United States. You know, States. one there there. There's so many stories in this, and one of them is just the process of your your mother's illness and the fact that she was so strong and 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 a wonderful person. And you talk about your memories of her, and then of course she battled breast cancer uh, back in some of the earlier times of some of the more modern treatments, and and then survived and lived much longer than the doctors thought she would. Um, so you've got this thread of of motherhood and and women and families built in. And one thing, I just want to make an overall big comment about your book and go there now, and then we'll jump around a little bit. Something I found amazingly unique about this book, um, My American Dream, here it is, was the fact that there are so many books by women who have been very successful in the world of business, which you were, and in even a tougher world, you were in the world of advertising, which if there's any male-dominated field, 
you know, you can do your homework and go watch episodes of Mad Men and see how that was. Um, that was it. And you crashed into that. Usually books about women who were that successful that early in a business cycle in the history of kind of the rise of feminist participation in our in our workforce. That's what the book's about. But your book is also one of the most wonderful and warmest books about family that I've read ever. And then in addition to that, it's a portrait of you as a wife and a mother. And you've combined all this in one book. And I just think that's stunning. And I want to talk to you about that because okay. this is, I read a lot and I've never seen a book like this. I've seen books by women about their parenting. I've seen books about their parents. I've seen books and I've done this program with women who have written books about their family during the Holocaust. We've gone there and done this. I've had some successful executives on this program who are women and done that story, but I've never seen a book in which the fullness of the human experience and especially the female human experience is so well told, including you almost bleeding out and dying several times after this really right. difficult birth. These, you know, this this is all in one book, guys. This is one book. <laughs> I mean, this this book, you know, should be like I said, you know, the only woman in the room, and it, it's just remarkable. So I just want to tell you, you've done something crazily wonderful here. Oh, thank you so much. You know, I I really when I when I got this journal and I read this journal mm. and I learned so much about my parents. You know, their their character their yes. bravery, their courage, uh, their, their determination, uh, yeah. their, their perseverance. And, and through all these challenges and hardships, their optimism, their, their absolute optimism and resilience. And I never knew these things until I was, till I had read this journal and I was, I was in my seventies at this point. And I thought, you know, I never want my children to be as ignorant of what came before them, because that's what makes us all what we are, uh, as I had been, uh, about what came before me. And that's why I told the story with its various threads and strands the way I did. I wanted them to know about the total me, <laughs> you know, mm. every part, every facet of, of who I was. Uh, because I yeah, thought that I, was I, important for them and for their yeah. for their children. Well, and it's very much to the, your family. And of course, I think that's what gives it this sort of warm vulnerability, because it's almost as if you're writing to your children and grandchildren. But of course, you've taken us all into this story. So let, let me touch a few points. You you experienced, I think, was it 1955 you were at Whitman? Yeah. OK, so in 1955, you're kind of being excluded because you uh, are, you know, from a Jewish background, um, and there are the sororities there, you know, what's the Greek system, whatever. Um, that ties into an experience as a child, which is so ironic that you're chased down a street by some bullies when you're a little girl screaming something about you being a Nazi because you're German. A dirty and yet, Nazi. Yeah, yeah. And a few years later, you're being excluded from a sorority at Whitman because you're Jewish. So here we have both immigrant experiences. You've got the anti-Semitic experience at one end when you're a young adult, and you've got this kind of typical um, sort of anti-whatever immigrant thing. And here you're an escapee. Could just talk a little bit about the the paradox of, of those two things, because it's like neither of them got who you really were or or you know what life is really about. And yet you've seen both things through your life, not just your parents, but you. And then we'll get to your sort of crashing into the advertising business. Okay. Um, when I was in the second grade and we lived in Chehalis, Washington, mm. a tiny, tiny little town of 5,000 people near nothing between Seattle and Portland, a hundred miles away from each. And I was in the second grade. We were a family unlike anybody in this town. This was a town of, of generations of families who had lived there nobody like us. Uh, there were, I think, two Jewish families in, in the town. Mm. So there was no Jewish culture to speak of at all. Uh, and, you know, my, we all spoke no English when we came, uh, only German. And then I 
eventually learned to speak English and my parents always had a, a German accent and we looked different from everyone else because mm. we had nothing. You know, I had to wear clothes that were hand-me-downs from the neighbors that my mother kind of awkwardly remodeled for me in quotes. Um, but we were different. We were different from everybody. And mm. it was the last thing I wanted to be. I wanted to be just like everybody else. So I was going home from school uh, I was in the second grade and these boys were chasing me and shouting and yelling, you dirty Nazi, you dirty yeah. Nazi. And I ran into the ladies room of the Texaco station, the service mm. station uh, to hide from them. And I locked the door and finally you know, I waited and waited and waited. And finally, I didn't hear them anymore. And I thought, gee, it's safe to go out now. And I couldn't get out. I had locked myself in. And I thought, oh, my God, what do I do? Second grader, seven years old. And I saw there was a window above the sink in the in the ladies room there. And so I climbed up on the sink. And I jumped out of the window. And I ran home to my mother sobbing and sobbing. They called me a dirty Nazi. Well, my mother was was floored, could not believe it. Here we we had run for our lives to escape from the Nazis. Yeah. And their daughter is being called a dirty Nazi. She was just stunned, just mm. stunned. So that was that was a very memorable kind of traumatic moment in my young life. And mm. then going on to to uh, to Whitman. Um, it's very interesting because I, uh, at the time that I went to Whitman, which is a, a small private liberal arts college in the eastern part of Washington State, mm. um, that the the norm was that everybody, I mean nearly everybody, men and women, belonged to fraternities and sororities, and mm. Rush happened right after we got to school. So I, mm -hmm. I went to Whitman so excited to be going there and very happy to be going to college and going to this quote big city of Walla Walla, population 25,000. Yeah. And um I I went through rush like all the women did and we went to parties and teas and picnics and what have you. And the day the bids came out, I went to my mailbox and it was empty. No bids. And I thought, well, this has to be a mistake. This yeah. can't be. Uh, so I sort of poked around and checked, and it was not a mistake. Yeah. And I had no idea why I would have been shunned by these sororities. I had mm. no idea. I thought, you know, I'd done well in high school. I'd been very active. Sure. I'd done well academically. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And it was mm. so humiliating because it was a small school where everybody knew everybody else and everybody knew what was going on with everybody else. It was just terrible. It was terrible. I, I thought I, I've got to walk tall and be proud and go about my business as best I can, try to make friends. And yeah. eventually I did get invited to join a sorority and um, I it never sort of went backwards to find out what had what had been the problem. And fast forward to my 50th 5-0 reunion mm. when my classmates and I were all sitting out on the lawn having a picnic lunch on a beautiful sunny day. Everybody's happy and chatting about, you know, what's happened in their lives and all that yeah. sort of thing. When the woman sitting across from me, who had been in a different sorority from the one I finally joined, uh, leaned over and whispered to me, you know, we would really have liked to pledge you, but you know, we couldn't. It was the Jewish thing. Yeah. Well, Frank, I almost fell off my chair. Mm -hmm. I... I was very naive. And as I said, I didn't grow up in a, U a Jewish culture at all. Yeah. It had not even occurred to me that that might have been the problem. Mm. So I, I had a very mixed reaction. I thought, oh, my God. Uh, on the other hand, it, it filled a very important puzzle piece into my sure. life to understand what that had been all about. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting bookend because later you've never been to Germany and you didn't want to go. And, and later in your life, you head back 
and sort of bookend that experience because you were dreading that. And then in a way, you know, came full circle going there. I don't want to go there now, though, because I want to jump into another part of your life when you're jumping okay. forward and suddenly you're being included in uh, a whole different thing. So I'm going to read from, um, what is it, page 67, Program Girl. In September 1959, I'm about to embark on the most profound experience of, of my life, one that will completely transform my sense of the world and my mindset. In the winter of early 1959, my years at Whitman are coming to a close. I have no idea what I'll do next. Young women in the late 50s don't really have many options. We can become nurses, teachers, or typists, or get married. None of those options interest me at all. So what am I going to do? What's the next move? From the older sister of a friend, I hear of a graduate program run jointly by the Harvard Business School and Radcliffe Graduate School. Women are not admitted directly to the Harvard Business School. It's for men only. So this program for women called the Harvard Radcliffe Program in Business Administration, or the program, is said to be, quote, separate but equal, unquote. It's modeled after the first year of the Harvard Business School MBA program, the same courses taught by the same professors, but in a different place across the Charles River in Cambridge at Radcliffe. And you tell that story, and I just want to give one anecdote, and within the, that time frame, you're invited to some event at Harvard, I think the Harvard Club or somewhere, you can tell us about it. And you come up to the door and the man says, oh no, th this entrance is for men only. You go down this back street around the back of the building and, and go in there. I put those events together and I'm just saying, wow, you know, um, man, you were climbing a steep mountain. And in addition to which, I just think, it, again, it was so telling that you're combining these stories with also a happy marriage, a family, children, being a working mother, and at the same time, intensely successful. Um, and again, it's just maybe you take it for granted, but these are not stories you usually see bound between the same the cover of the same book. Mm. I, I just think it's amazing. So talk about that whole Harvard thing, what it led well, to, why was that such a turning point for you? It was, well, first of all, my my... My worldview, so to speak, was very, very narrow. I had grown up in Chehalis, this town of 5,000. Mm. Uh, and my parents, of course, were Berliners. And my, my mother, in particular, always was very concerned that I had such a, such a narrow worldview. And I thought she was kind of snobby about it. You know, she always wanted me to... Yeah kind of get out there and see and learn more and what have you. Uh, when I went to Boston, uh, it was the most amazing experience. It, it was, you know, all of a sudden I sort of understood what my mother was talking about. Well, and you're going to the Boston Symphony and you're doing all these things that your mother's exactly. culture background in Berlin had been about. And now right, you're doing right. The, the history, the culture mm -hmm. and the diversity of people who were there, you know, there were there were, I mean, most of the people that I met were, were people who were in the business school and the law school at Harvard and so on. And these were smart people who had, you know, had. To, it was a period when a lot of the men had been in the service before they came to school. Yes. So they'd had, they had sort of uh, more of a worldview than anything I had ever had. And then, of course, learning about business. I, th I thought I sort of had an idea of what business was all about. I'd always worked and I, I liked working and liked making money. And, and our family had so little money. Money was always important because mm. we never had enough, you know. So um, I learned very quickly when I was in the Harvard Radcliffe program that I didn't know much about business at all. So that part of it also was a very mind-opening experience. Terrific. I mean, terrific. Yeah. Really. Um, and the story that you told, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a funny story. Uh, women were not allowed to go to the, the Harvard Business School's classes. Those were for men only. But they had big, uh, they, they often invited sort of the tycoons of business from around the world to come mm. and speak. Wonderful, wonderful speakers. And we women, we were called girls. We girls and, were, and you know, they called them men and they men, called you girls. Right. And we were girls. And we girls were invited to come to listen to these speeches. And they had cocktail parties afterwards, which were, you know, fun. And, and we got to meet interesting mm. people. And then they always had a dinner to um, honor the speaker. Yeah. And the dinner was hosted by 
one of the famous professors from the business school, there were a handful of business school men and they always invited one program girl. And the incident that you talk about, I was the program you girl were who in, was invited yeah. to dinner. Only, right. Once again, the only woman in the room. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And and I was so thrilled to be invited to this dinner. I just, oh, I could hardly wait to go. Mm. Got all dressed up, went marching off to the Harvard Club in Boston. And the story that you told is what happened. I went to the door and I, I um, you know, sort of went right up to the door and the doorman held his hands up and he said, no, 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 you can't come in here. And I said, well, I'm invited to dinner here. And he said, no, no, you can't come in here. And I said, but I'm invited to dinner here. He said, you have to go around the alley and go through the kitchen. And it didn't even occur to me to be rebellious or upset or anything else. I was so happy to be at this dinner. I just did exactly what he said. And I went off to dinner. Mm. And um, years later on reflection, I thought, you know, the whole thing was kind of ridiculous yeah. uh, to, to have these two identical programs one for men and one for women, because women were not thought to have enough value to mm -hmm. really invest in a second year of business education. So yeah. let's just give them one year and let's not give them an MBA. Let's give them a certificate, yeah. uh, the girls. And, um, you know, fortunately, that's all changed. And women now do go to the Harvard Business School, which I'm very happy to say. Mm. Uh, and I, I don't know what's going on at the Harvard Club, but hopefully they've made some changes as well. Let me fast forward and bookend that story with another one, which is, which is in a different context, but is the same story in an odd way. You're an executive. You're a big deal. This is many years <laughs> later. You can fix me in on the year here. Um, I'm never good on dates and times, but you can fill that in. But it's it's far in the future from this story. And you're now going to Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi in Japan as part of an advertising marketing research delegation from your big time advertising company. We're going to get into that, how that all happened. They seat you around a round table and they assume that some big strapping male who's part of your delegation must be the leader. And he, they put him in the middle of the table, which traditionally in, J in Japan, that's where the leader sits. And they stick you way the hell down the other end. <laughs> and then they look at the actual list and figure out you're actually in charge. And they have just done this faux pas of seating the, the power person in charge of this program who's come to Mitsubishi to help them with their marketing and advertising. They've stuck you at the end of the table, and then they scurry around quite, quite in, in, in embarrassment, trying to reseat you, and get the precedent right, and therefore sort of strike out on all counts. You know, women can't, can't be a, a woman couldn't be in charge. Plus, it's got to be this big strapping guy. So there's that aspect. They got it all wrong, and then the, you ran into sort of age old uh, ideas of, of precedence and formality. Um, Tell that story a little bit, and then let's go through your climb within your industry and talk about that. But let's sure, do this story sure. first. Well, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi um, hired Gray uh, to introduce its line of cars in the United States. Yeah. And um, nobody in the United States really at that time knew anything about Mitsubishi to the extent that anybody knew anything it was, you know, they were among the first to have big television sets. They were sort sure. of known a little bit for electronics, but certainly not for cars. So the Mitsubishi management team said, let's send a team from Gray to learn about Mitsubishi and understand our company and understand what we're all about so that mm. when they really take on this assignment, they'll understand what they're dealing with. Uh, not a not a non-entity, but rather... Uh, you know, quite a formidable company. So our team, a group of men and me, uh, went to Narita Airport where we were met by a, our guide and we all got into a little van and, and the guide said, you know, we want you to understand that Mitsubishi accounts for one eighth the gro gross national product of Japan, one eighth. Mm. We are in, and she's pointing out all these things. We're in construction, we're in banking, we're in infrastructure, we 
make airplanes, we make cars. Yeah. We're in every kind of big business you can imagine. And this is just what she was telling us as we were driving from the airport to the office. So then when we got to the office, uh, <laughs> the story that you just told is what happened. And actually we all had business cards and our names and titles and so forth were in English on one side of the, the business card and in Japanese on the other. Mm. And, you know, there was quite a formal ceremony where we exchanged sure. business cards and, and uh, they got my business card, looked at it in English and turned it over. And there was a gasp in the room. Yeah. There was you said gasp. you could hear it audibly going exactly, around. Exactly. 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 <laughs> and as you said, much scurrying around and, and, you know, we were going to many different places in Japan and there were many phone calls being made all over the place, you know, to be sure that this never, this faux pas would never happen again. Uh, but on that same trip, um, you know, as, as your listeners are probably aware, uh, the, the working men in uh, the salary men, I think they're called sure. in Japan, uh, have a ritual where they all go to their clubs after work. Mm. And in their clubs, they have um, karaoke and everybody has a has a very American sounding song by an American sounding crooner. You know, so there's I left my heart in San Francisco, Tony Bennett style, yeah. the YMCA, you know, all these songs. And um, there, there's a lot of alcohol and a lot of fun and a lot of, you know, drinking and so on. And they invited all the men on our team to go with them to their club after work. Mm. And I said, well, I would like to see this club. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. There now was, what do we do? Big huddle. What do we do? What do we do? <laughs> She's a woman. She's a woman. What do we do? Well, they finally came up with, with sort of a compromise. They said, well, we will have a guide take you there, but you can only stay for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then you have to leave. Um, and of course, the guys stayed there for the whole evening and, and uh, sort of enjoyed themselves. But uh, it, it was it was <laughs> it was kind of an interesting experience. Yeah, well, it was a good bookend to the Harvard thing. Um, let me reintroduce you and then I'm going to ask you just a question to to kind of recap for us just this phenomenal career part of your life and then we'll get into some of the family stuff um but we'll do the we'll do the career block and the companies you worked for and what you did and just your rise your spectacular rise after this harvard turning point uh this is in conversation with frank schaefer i am frank schaefer my guest today is uh barbara summer fagan and her book here i have an advanced copy my american dream a journey from fascism to freedom that is barbara age two on the cover having just arrived in the u.s having survived and escaped from nazi germany and barbara has been in many things in her life a young german-speaking refugee who fled with her parents from nazi germany in 1940 uh, a wife, a mother, a caregiver. Now, what's so interesting is usually put that stuff in the biographical notes, but the book's only about one thing. No, this book's about all of that, including, by the way, listen up, please, everybody, balancing a meteoric career as a woman at the top of a business where she's the only woman in the room most of the time, including board seats, and being a mother and a wife and having a home and also making that a priority. And that's really unbelievable because there's so much written today um, about, quote, balancing career and family. Quit reading anything else. Just read Barbara's book because it's it's all there. Um, that's not in my introductory notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I would just ask you um, to give us a recap of that um, stuff I was talking about in terms of just, OK, you're at Harvard and then. Take us a little bit through your career and the and the milestones and the firsts and the fact that you're in advertising doing research and you've got huge accounts, you know, um, if I remember rightly, I mean, everything from Mars Chocolate to Revlon and all these people you met and everything else. This is a, a, an incredible career. So just sort of take us through that part of your life. OK, OK. I um uh... When I, when I got finished with the program, I knew that I wanted to go into marketing and marketing happened in New York. So I thought, well, um, I'm going to have to take myself to New York and yeah. sort of, sort of uh, like my parents, you know, I came to New York with nothing. 
uh, no friends, no job, no place to live, no money. I arrived at Grand Central and I had my my suitcase and I had to leave it in a locker there because I didn't have a place to live. <laughs> so I, I found a job at the then Vic Chemical Company, now part of Procter & Gamble, the makers of Vicks Vapor Rub and Formula 44 and all those good brands that all of us have known and used over the years. And, um, you know, in, in those days, um, well, even today, the, the career path stepping stones in marketing were jobs in product management and brand management. Mm. And just as we've been talking about, those jobs were completely closed to women. And so I thought, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? I want to be in marketing. So I kind of had to go through the back door into yeah. market research. And that's the kind of job I got at BIC. And mm. I loved it. It was just great. I loved working on these big grants and doing research that helped, uh, you know, the, the, the real marketers make important decisions and so forth. And I'd been there for about a year and, and uh, had done well, gotten good feedback. And I thought, well, uh, I think I need to talk to my boss about my career path development. Uh, so I made an appointment, went in to talk to him and I gave him my my thought, you know, I wanted to talk with him about my career path and he just stared at me and then he threw back his head and he just started roaring with laughter. And I said, well, Tom, why are you laughing? Hmm. He said, career path. There is no career path. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, women, they get married, they have babies, they leave. I said, Tom, I plan to get married. I plan to have babies, but I went to business school. I plan to have a career. Hmm. Well, he said, Barbara, if you want to have a career, I can't help you. You have to leave. And so I did. And um, I found my way into the advertising business, which I absolutely loved right from the get-go, right from the minute I, I walked in. I loved uh, the, the strategic problem definition, problem solving. I loved the creativity. I, I loved um, the collaboration, you know, getting mm -hmm. a lot of smart people together to solve problems and make make important things happen. And um, loved it, did well, got good feedback. And a couple of years down the road, I was married and I found that I was pregnant. And so I thought, well, um, I'll work until the baby is born. and then I'll take a few weeks off and then I'll come back. And I began to show and I thought, well, I better go tell my boss about this. So I, I um, went in and I said, you know, I've got great news. I'm going to have a baby. And my mm. boss, whose name was Val, he said, Barbara, that's great. I'm so happy for you and Jim. Congratulations. That's wonderful. Uh, and I said, let me tell you my plan. And I told him, mm. work until the baby's born. Uh, take a few weeks off, come back, oh, and his face sagged, and he said, no, no. I said, what do you mean? We don't do that. You don't do what? We don't have maternity leaves. I said, but Val, that's my plan. I planned, and I told him again. He said, well, I can't help you with that. I have to go to the higher-ups about that. Mm -hmm. And I said, thank you, thank you, that's great. Um, and he did go to bat for me with the higher-ups, and a few days later, he called me, Mm -hmm. And he said, I've got great news for you. You've got a maternity leave. He said, but mm -hmm. right away, he said, but I have to tell you, we're not going to pay you during the time you're out. And we can't promise you that you'll have the same job when you mm -hmm. come back. But you do have a maternity leave. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I really was was very grateful for this. Because and what this year was, was that, by the way? Do you remember? 1966. 1966. 66. Okay, yeah. I, I, um, I really realized it was the first ever in this big prominent agency. And it sort of set the pathway for all mm. the women who came after me, which was really a big deal. It was really an important thing. Yeah. So then um, had the baby and continued working there. And um, I began to hear about this agency called Gray Advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, they were bringing in all these big accounts as you were talking about, you know, uh, sort of one after the other. And, and they were on a, on a real roll and 
getting very, very well known for, um, you know, doing a really good job with the accounts that they have. And I thought, I wonder what's going on there. You know, something, mm. they must be doing something uh, that that's attracting all this, all this business. So I began to go to some conferences and, and I listened to some of their senior executives explain what Gray's approach was mm. to developing and building advertising, building brands, building, building communication strategies and so on. And, um, you know, in, in advertising at that time, uh, advertising was developed kind of from the gut, so to speak. You know, a mm. bunch of smart people sat in a room and brainstormed and, and uh, it was mainly men and you know most of the advertising dollars were being spent on consumer products sure. which are sold principally to women so the men sometimes asked their wives what their opinions were sometimes asked their secretaries but by and large it was men working from the gut gray said we're going to turn that whole concept on its ear we're going to work on trying to figure out strategically the whole upfront part of the equation hmm. Who should the advertising be for? Who should it be against? What's the competition? What's the, what's the message that's going to persuade people to come to our brand versus the competitors? Yeah. Um, what's the emotional connection that we can make with these people? And we used, we at Gray, later, later including me, but at that time not, uh, Gray had developed all kinds of important new uh research and analytical tools and techniques sure. to do large scale attitude research. So they knew not only demographically who the category, who their, their targets were or what their behaviors were all about, but they knew all about their wants and needs, uh, their wishes and hopes and dreams, their worries and concerns. And out of all that data, they developed strategies to help build brands through advertising mm. that was focused on the right people against the right competition and with the right messages. And I thought, oh my gosh, I want to do that. I want to do that because this is an agency where the kind of work that I do really matters to the agency. I mean, it's kind of part of the lifeblood of the agency. Sure. It's the starting point for making things happen. And I was very interested in making things happen. So um, I, I, sort of scattered around and I finally got an interview at Gray uh, with a very wonderful woman whose name was Betty Coon. And we talked and she said, you know, Barbara, I really like you and I think you do well here, but mm. you don't quite have the right experience. If you go out for a year and get the kind of experience that we, that we require for this yeah. job and you come back to me in a year, I will hire you. Mm. And you spoke early on about the importance of luck and timing. Yes. Uh, I was very lucky because uh, one of my colleagues at that time was about to go off and start a new job doing exactly the kind of work she said I needed to do. Mm. And he wanted me to come and work as his assistant. So that's what I did. And I worked exactly a year and I did not like working there at all. But mm. I knew that I had to stick it out for a year because that was going to be my point of entry to do mm. what I really wanted to do, which was work at Gray. So a year later, I went back to Betty Coombe and I explained what I'd been doing. And she said, great, you're hired. Mm. And that was the beginning of a many decades long, fabulous career at Gray that I so, adored every minute of. Give me the, give me the kind of, um, you know, there's a there's a wall that has a big plaque of you on it and a big company in New York saying, you know, these were the groundbreaking luminaries. If we were just touching those mountaintops for a minute, sorry to make you brag about yourself, but you, you know, let's work back from the fact that you're a trustee of Whitman and endowed a chair there. We'll start there, sort of go backwards and talk to me about the kind of headline who Barbara Summer Fagan is in terms of she was this executive and that executive and did this and did that, just sort of touch those. And then I want to go to the family history a little bit. Okay, okay. Um, you know, as I said, I worked many, many decades at Gray, starting in a little office next to the next to the broom closet uh, mm -hmm. and kind of working my way up over the years. Um, and, and at Gray, I was deeply involved with our clients uh, at times when either their businesses were in trouble 
or yeah. they were they were doing well, but they wanted to go to the next step. What was mm-hmm. the next level up? How could we help them? And I was very, very deeply involved in all that. Um, I, I worked with fantastic clients, some of whom you mentioned, including Mars, Procter & Gamble, uh, 3M, um, the, the U.S. government. We worked for the, for the Navy and for the yeah. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, and on and on at Bloomingdale's, you know, we we were in every kind of business you could imagine working with wonderful clients. Well, and that one advertising campaign you did for drunk driving and teenagers mm-hmm. actually was credited with lowering the right of highway for uh, driving. It for was fantastic. It was fantastic. Do you have time for me to t- talk about it for a second? Yeah, but I want you to, I, I, I'm, I'll I'm my own worst enemy. Okay. I want you okay. to just touch okay. the high points. Okay. You've got to right. brag for a minute, Barbara. Because okay. I, well, you know. I, I became, eventually I became a, a vice president at Gray, and that was very unusual for a woman. But even yes. more unusual was the fact that I became a senior vice president at yeah. Gray. And at that time, uh, there, there was a little announcement of that in the New York Times and, and the Wall Street uh, and the Wall Street Journal as well. And yeah. the Wall Street Journal sent me a plaque with mm-hmm. a, a, an etching of their announcement, and it yeah. said, "The Wall Street Journal, read by all the men who make things happen." And then my announcement. And I thought, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah, the picture of the pack is in the book. It's like, oh, wait a minute. There's something wrong with this. All the men that make the the history. And here's the woman, you know, that's just done it. So, Well, eventually I I became an executive vice president and the head of strategic services for Gray worldwide, Mm. traveled the world for our agency and with our clients. And I became uh, one of the six member uh, executive management team of the agency. Again, yeah. the only woman in the room. Uh, now, and then I wait also, a second, before you breeze by it, then you become a board member of a huge- Well, I was going to say, yeah, I, I was just going to talk about that. I I, uh, I became a, a member of the board of the VF Corporation, which mm. is the company that owns big brands like the North Face and Vans. And at that point, it had yeah. a lot of jeans brands as well. And once and again, you're the only woman in the room. The only woman in the room. And the men in the room had no idea what to do with me. Uh, <laughs> I think they kind of looked on me as, quote, the woman. And yeah. um, they talked among themselves and they they talked over me. And I learned I had to just keep raising my voice until... Mm. They stopped and listened. And when they listened, they realized that I did have something to contribute. Yeah. And after that, um, you know, I became part of part of the board as opposed to the <laughs> woman. Um, so, you know, I, I joined a, a, a couple of New York Stock Exchange boards. And then uh, when I retired from Gray, I began to work with J.P. Morgan Capital Partners. Hmm. And again, being, you know, one, I, I wasn't the only woman in the room, but I was certainly one of very few women in the room. Yes. And they asked me to sit on the boards of some of their portfolio companies hmm. representing J.P. Morgan Capital Partners, yeah. uh, particularly companies that were in the consumer products area where I hmm. had expertise. And basically, they did not. So I did that. Um, And then you talked about my involvement with Whitman College, you know, where I went to college. Um, I became a trustee at Whitman College. uh, And um, it was an interesting time because uh, they had a new president and the the president was interested in developing a new strategic plan for taking Mm. Whitman forward. And that was kind of my background and my sweet spot. So I could really contribute a lot to that. And the other thing that I did there that I, I... I'm very happy about is um, I work with one of the other trustees uh, to talk with first generation students, mm. people who were the children of refugees or immigrants and other people who hadn't gone to college and uh, really try to understand what their feelings were about women. And they mm. really needed a lot of support, which they weren't getting. So we developed a program for them, a fly-in program, bringing them into the campus uh, a week before school started, giving them mentors, uh, giving them all kinds of of briefings and orientation uh, to help them understand 
all the support services that Whitman could offer them and, and to and give them a Jim mentor. And you and out a scholarship as well. We did, we did. Again, for, for uh, refugees and immigrants mm. or children thereof, and, and when I was at Whitman, very few people went into the private sector, went into business. Mm -hmm. So I wanted this scholarship to be for people who wanted to go into yeah. the private sector. And by the way, thank you for not correcting me because I said it was a chair before and it was a scholarship. Right, right. And Thanks. I know you know I got it wrong and you were very nice, which is why you're a great leader no. because you know you, you let me man speak my error. <laughs> <laughs> it's all okay. <laughs> all you... went to the same place. <laughs> hey, listen. Let me let me dive in here a second. Um, introduce you again, and then just um, we're gonna we're heading for the wrap it up here. This is Frank Schaefer in conversation with Frank Schaefer, and I'm talking with Barbara Sum Summer Fagan about her book, My American Dream: A Journey from Fascism to Freedom, and a journey from outright misogyny and exclusion to inclusion and raising my voice and being the only woman in the room. You could add that to the cover too. Um, I want to just talk a little bit here about your family. Before I do, I'll just say, please subscribe to my In Conversation with Frank Schaefer on Apple Podcasts and to my Substack commentary. It has to be said at frankschaefer.substack.com. And uh, My American Dream is my next, it has to be Red Book Club Pick for the month of July. So we'll make it our book club pick in July and we will be pushing it throughout and then as oh, well. Fantastic. So thank you for writing a terrific book. Let me turn to the family a minute because I, I, I think you know people are hearing these amazing achievements in, in the world of business and advertising and great stories as well. And the book is wonderful, not to mention your father's diary at the beginning of it, which is incredible. Um, one of the moving parts of the book is your parenting skills, your dedication to your family while being an executive. And then in addition to that, as if your plate was not full, your husband, Jim, has a series of strokes and you turn out to also be this executive who's also a caregiver to your husband. And we, we, we go with you through the passage of his decline and death. We've done that with your mom as well. And again, I just want to say, I've never seen all of these threads in one book. I've read whole books about a caregiving experience, whole books about, I nearly bled out when I had my triplets and here's mm. how it happened. I've read whole books about all these things, but I don't know where you wanna go, but talk about being a caregiver, talk about nearly bleeding out after delivering triplets, talk about this sort of <laughs> powerful living experience you've had on top of all this stuff. I mean. You know, they don't know who you are when you walk into Mitsubishi, but on the other hand, you're a person who's had these incredible you know, biological procreative experiences, plus caregiving, plus marriage, plus children. It's just very full. Well, <laughs> where do I start? Um, let me start by saying I, I met my husband and, and Jim at, when mm. we were both at the Harvard Business School, I in the program, I the program girl and he the yeah. Harvard Business School man. Um, and I... Uh, we we married and um, we were right from the beginning very strong partners. Uh, yeah. Really very strong complementary partners, and we agreed that we wanted to have a family. And we both had, you know, career uh, ambitions, and we wanted to do well in our careers. Uh, and and we really worked together to make that happen. So our our first son was Michael. And uh, two or three years later, I learned that I was pregnant. And lo and behold, I was pregnant with triplets. I, I mm. absolutely was stunned. I couldn't believe it. Um, I, not unhappily, but but just stunned, uh, totally stunned. And you and said Jim laughed when he heard. like you know. Jim was so thrilled. He was so <laughs> thrilled. He, he always thought that I would be having twins. He said, you look so different this time. Yeah. From when you did what, what you look like with Michael, I said, oh, no, no, it's a second child. They always look different. But then when my my uh, obstetrician said, you know, I, th I think I should take an x-ray. In those days, they didn't have sonograms. I said, an x-ray? Why would you do that? Mm. And she said, well, you do look just a bit big. Well, yeah. so anyway, um, it, it turned out that uh, 
one of, and, and she told me right away, she said, you know, with multiple births, the more there are, the higher the risk. So, yeah. you know, we're going to take good care of you, but it's a risky proposition. Mm -hmm. And so when they were born, one was just simply not viable. Sure. And, um, you know, to your point, I, I was in the hospital for quite a while because the two who, who, who live, Peter and Daniel, mm. uh, were very tiny and they had to be in the, in the uh, neonatal care area. And um, I finally went home. And the first night I was home, I had been away from Michael for a long time. And I, mm. I didn't like that. I was very concerned about that. Um, the first night I began to just hemorrhage terribly and I was totally petrified. I, I knew this was bad, bad, bad. Mm -hmm. So we went careening up to the hospital and the doctor finally stabilized me and I was drifting out of consciousness. I could not speak. And I thought, please do not let me die. I cannot leave Jim with these three kids, you know, um, two new babies and Michael, I need to live. And so we got through that. And then lo and behold, it happened again. Yeah. It happened again the following week. So that was a very scary, scary, scary time. Mm. But, you know, we, we kind of got through it and, uh, and went on, <laughs> went on. Uh, we had a very lively, um, very rambunctious family. When my kids talk about growing up now, they say, you know, we really laughed a lot. We had a lot of fun in our family. So, you know, that's all, that's all wonderful. Um, and, and Jim was a very, very involved father. He loved kids and he loved his kids in particular, mm. and they knew it and they just adored him, you know? So, so we had a very loving family, I would say mm. with strong bonds Jim and I didn't do a lot other than be in our family and, and, uh, and work, you know, that's, yeah. those were our two things. Well, you kind of filled your time and then he got quite ill. Oh, Speaking my gosh. of your kids, one of them wound up uh, managing or owning, I forget which one of the uh, NBA teams. Right. He's, he's the president of the Milwaukee Bucks. Peter that's Sagan. it. And he's got, yes. there's a picture of him with the, the, you know, with the, with the trophy, <laughs> the trophy. Exactly. Yeah. But let's oh, not fabulous. go there. That's a whole, that's a different fabulous. story, but wow. Your kids have done well, let me Let me tell you about Jim. Um, he was 54 years old mm. and I had taken a client to dinner the night before. And when I got home, he was asleep, which I thought was perfectly normal. Mm. And the next morning was a Saturday. And he used to bring me a cup of coffee in bed on Saturdays. It was kind of a little treat that he gave me. And I saw him walking in with this cup of coffee. And I saw that his hand, his arm was all curled. Yeah. And then I saw that he was dragging his foot. And I thought, oh, my God, mm. I think he's having a stroke. Yeah. Well, he had a very serious stroke. Mm. Uh, 54 years old. He, he fortunately, he... Uh, didn't lose his mental faculties. He didn't lose his speech. Thank goodness. Uh, but he, his right side was pretty severely paralyzed. He was mobile, yeah. but very slow, limped a lot, you know. Um, and this was a shattering experience for him, of course. You know, a yeah. young man kind of in the prime of his life, uh, doing very well in business and, and, he, he was a guy who just loved life, loved life, loved, happy and energetic and yeah. loved his family. And all of a sudden, his world has changed and it changed the world for all of us in our family. Sure. When I, I took him to the doctor, you know, when, when he was having this stroke, uh, the doctor said, well, Mr. Fagan, you are having a stroke. Like right now, you're having it. You're in the middle of it. Yeah. You have to go to the emergency room immediately. And he called me back and he said very quietly, Mrs. Fagan, your life will never be the same. Mm. And that was so true. Mm. That was so true. Um, I mean, we, we adjusted, you know, but it was clearly an adjustment. And sure. I was very, very fortunate because my, my boys were um, all in New York at that time. And they were very devoted to Jim, as I said, and, and, mm. you know, really came to see him, brought their children to come to see him. So, and that just lifted him, you know, really lifted his spirits. And, uh, but it was, it was a shattering, shattering mm. experience. Mm. And mm. then 
nine years later, he had a second yeah. very serious stroke, which exacerbated all the issues and problems that he had originally. Hmm. Uh, and he needed even more help. It really made him totally dependent. Sure. You know, which he hated, 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 hated. But we all did the best we could do. That's all you can and, do. And you were still working. Yes. Yeah. So and you... I, 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 in a in a sort of an interesting way, I was very thankful for my work mm. because because I was working on problems that could be solved. Yeah. Where at home, I was in a situation that wasn't going to be solved. Mm. I mean, we could adjust, but we couldn't solve. Yeah. So I was grateful for my work and for my colleagues. Uh, you know, I had a lot of very close, good colleagues. And um, it was very important at that time. Mm. Yeah, let me just wrap it up there because we're we're running out of time here. And just say again, in all seriousness, uh, My American Dream, A Journey from Fascism to Freedom is one of the most unusual books I've read because it combines these threads of family care and passionate love for children and grandchildren, passionate marital love, partnership in marriage, passionate love for family, a family history that is as fraught as any as I, I've ever read. Um, your father's diary at the beginning is terrifically moving. Um, and then, lo and behold, within this book, My American Dream, is one of the great women's success stories before it was a thing. <laughs> so Barbara was the only woman in the room and she wasn't there because of some executive decision to quote, hire more women. She was there battling uphill the whole way, strictly on the merits and then was terrifically successful. So I think it's a great American story. It's not just my American dream. This is a great American story and I love it. So we're going to make it part of our book club. And Barbara, I can't wish you anything but the best with this and just let you know that you have made a real friend through your writing. I consider myself your friend because I love the book. I love your family. And um, we'll do anything we can to let people know about this book. If you think of things, please let Ernie and my producer and I know, and we will do that. And we're going to push the hell out of it uh, in our book club. And I just can't thank you enough for writing this book. Oh, thank you so much, Frank. It's been so good to be with you. May I tell people my website? You will link. Yeah, you can please tell them now. And then Barbara Ernie, Fagan. my producer, will link to you on oh, everything. Fantastic. Fantastic. Barbara Fagan, F-E-I-G-I-N, one word, dot com. My website will tell you more. And uh, you can buy the book through the website as well. Yes. And it's been and great being say, with you. Ernie is going to put all these uh, things so people can link to you. And by the way, when I ring off here, to use the old phone term, stick <laughs> around for a minute and talk to Ernie to make sure you get all this squared away. Don't go anywhere when thank I you. end this. Thank you for the book. Thank you. Yeah, thank really. You very, thank very you. much. It's been yeah. wonderful to be with you. Thanks. Me, me too. This is a real privilege. Thank you so much. Thanks.